Political junkies have been following these primaries in the election year, but far more people are actually following what is continuing to be a banner period for culture, from debating Barbie at the Oscars to the juggernaut of the NFL experiencing its ongoing time of Taylor, one of the world's most popular singers, engaging a new fan base. Taylor could also make history this Sunday as the first artist to win a fourth Album of the Year award at the Grammys, one of six Grammy nominations she has this weekend. And while the fans have already spoken, we should note, more people listen to her music on streaming across the world than anyone else last year. And today's technology empowers incredibly wide instant access to music for free. The Spanish-language singer Bad Bunny is one of the other most streamed artists, even for many listeners who don't speak his language. There's actually a wider shift here. While great music has always touched people, today it has fundamentally broader reach than ever before. The Beatles' fastest-selling album, for example, moved about half a million records in its first week. The Beatles' most popular album ever, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, sold over 30 million records all time across decades. So tonight I ask you, how many plays did Taylor get, say, last year? Well, it was over 100 million. It was actually over 500 million. I could tell you it was over a billion. Indeed, it was over 10 billion. She did 26 billion streams in a year alone. But this is not old versus new. The same technology is bringing the same Beatles I mentioned to a whole new generation of listeners across the globe from streaming their many classics to, as you may have heard, the release of a new actual new Beatles song last year that tapped the original artist's music and voices, as well as AI enhancement. This is certainly an auspicious time for music, and streaming allows these young people to listen to classic artists that you or we might like, but in a different era, in a different time, they wouldn't have even been able to buy those albums, because not all of them were always sitting on the shelves in the first place. So there's plenty of excitement as these Grammy Awards I mentioned arrive this Sunday, a night that has often made music history. What a big night, and we turn to the man in charge. Harvey Mason Jr. is CEO of the aforementioned Recording Academy, the man behind music's biggest night. You are very busy these days. Really happy to have you on the beat uh, as we look towards the Grammys. How are you? Thank you. I am really, really happy. Excited to be on the beat. Love the name, the beat. You've got some great credit, great highlights edited together there. Iconic moments, great performance. I'm back here nodding my head the whole time. <laughs> yeah, right. And so many of those remind you of what was happening in the different moments of that year. That's what the, the night can be about. Let's start with uh, what I mentioned, that people sometimes forget that while there are complexities, and in the news we cover the downsides and the problems with technology all the time, frankly, um, it is faster, easier, and cheaper uh, for people around the world, a, a kid sitting in Africa or in the Caribbean or, or, or in Sweden, um, to gather all this music and listen to it. How does that affect um, music and the Grammys? Well, you said it. it is an auspicious time for music, and we're very excited both on the creative side and what we're able to make based on technology and advancements and the ability to create something incredible on a laptop or a computer. Also, the idea of being able to push out your music and have your fans and consumers be able to access it instantly. And you talked about the lack of borders and the global nature of music, listening to music from different languages, from different cultures, different continents. To me, it's an incredible time to be in the space, in music, as a consumer or a creator. Yeah. Um, there are different types of borders. The language and geographic uh, country borders that divide so much of us in this world, uh, you just mentioned it. it. It transcends. I love that Bad Bunny's doing so well. I love that Taylor's popular around the world, right? And then the, the boundaries of time 
are actually dissipating. Um, so that's fascinating. I want to read from the rules you guys said as you look at AI. You said, okay, only human creators are eligible. Tells you the era we live in that that's a thing you have to say out loud. <laughs> so songs you say can, can have AI or other tech. They can be included as part of the brew or the, the cooking, if you will. But there has to be, quote, proof that a real person meaningfully contributed to the song as well. That's how NPR describes your rules. And just uh, I want to play someone known to you and our audience so well, Paul McCartney, discussing how um, John Lennon is gone. Um, but they had the raw source material, and they were able to kind of bring some of that into a new Beatles song. Take a listen. We were able to take John's voice and get it pure through this AI so that then we could mix the record as you would normally do. You know, so it, it gives you it gives you some sort of uh, leeway. So there's a good side to it, and then a scary side, and uh, we'll just have to see where that leads. Explain to us how you all look at this, um, and how you hear from artists, uh, because technology from I mean, you could have Dylan going electric, uh, or Beatles going AI. Technology's always been in the mix to to a certain extent. It has, and creators are early adopters of technology. As you said, we've always done that since the advent of, you know, poking holes in a stick and blowing through it. But we are about creativity, and we're about human creativity. I don't think there's going to be a machine, software, hardware that can create or replicate what comes from the heart, what comes from the soul of human creators. What we do have to acknowledge, though, is AI has the power to do some really unique things. And I have so many thoughts on, on your Paul quote, but I'll stick to this. As long as we can figure out how to make sure creators are credited, they're protected with the ability to approve the use, and they're remunerated fairly and properly, I think AI can be something ex that we can all be excited about. In, in not, not having that, I'm petrified and then terrified that it's going to run away with us because for example with paul's uh, example having john's voice recreated by ai where someone could do whatever they wanted with it is not acceptable but in paul's case using ai to clean the, the sound of the voice or remove other elements or extraneous noises that's beneficial and can amplify the creativity so there's a lot of ambiguity there there's a lot of different levels and nuance to how ai can be used as long as we get it straight i'm excited about it yeah, so let me build on that question. You're, you're sort of uh, telling viewers and reminding everyone about how that was used, and it was in concert with his original band. So whatever debates they've ever had over the years, there's a credibility uh, to that process. And you're mentioning something else that's happening, which is there's the ability now to take someone's voice and treat it like an instrument, to take a Sinatra or a Tupac, uh, and some of those are sort of bootleg or unauthorized. Um, where do you think that line is, especially for artists who, who may be long gone or even their, their families might not know or know how to answer the question of which thing would they want to be um, sort of pasted onto like Velveeta, when for many of us music means something more than, than that. We have to recognize it's going to happen, Ari. Unfortunately, this is not going to change. It's not going anywhere. The technology is not going away. The question is going to be who wants to participate, who wants to be involved in that, whether that's an artist or their estate. And I think there'll be some really unique and creative things that come out of this technology and the use of AI. It will extend the careers of people, potentially translate songs into other languages. Uh, estates can hear from their, their artists for a lot longer in a new creative ways. So a lot of possibility, but got a few things to straighten out first. Yeah. Uh, and finally, what is the most fun or the most daunting for you going into this year? I mean, one of the things I always remind people about the Grammys, and I'm not just saying that because this is the beat and we love music, is the Oscars are interesting, um, but they don't make or perform any movies that night. Uh, you guys are putting on an incredibly large concert in addition to an awards show, and th that's just fundamentally different because of the nature of the art. Uh, so what's, what's fun or daunting as you go into the big night and concert? It's all daunting because you're dealing with the biggest and the best and the brightest artists and creators and songwriters in the world, getting them all into L.A. Uh, and getting them organized enough to have a celebration. But what's exciting about it is the gathering of people, the gathering of all different genres, different genders, beliefs, backgrounds, geographies, and coming together to celebrate music and the excellence of music and the power of music. You know, we give away the awards. We're excited about the Grammys. We love the trophies and celebration. But for me, I'm really passionate about the work that we do at the Academy. 365 days a year, we take this money, we take the visibility from the show, we push it out in the way of serving 
the music community because, Ari, and you can appreciate this, we need music more now than ever, the healing power, the unifying power of music. What music can do is magic, and we need it. We need to make sure creators are enabled and protected and have the thriving space to do what they do. The New York Times' Jessica Bennett reported from inside the courtroom on this case for her new piece, The Audacity of E. Jean Carroll. And journalist Robbie Myers oversaw Carroll's writing and actually testified for her in this case. Welcome to both of you. Uh, Robbie, you've been close to all of this. Uh, it got worse uh, as time went on. We've covered how much worse and how much uh, st uh, stiffer the penalty is. Uh, what have you learned in, in being a, a direct party to this and a witness uh, across this whole process? Well, I learned a lot of things. I mean, I learned a lot just from watching the team, from the legal team, brilliant, as everyone has said, because um, they, the way that they put the um, people who were testifying together and the clarity with which they could talk about Eugene as a person, about what she went through, about how well they knew her, um, I think was really, you know, a big part of it. And, you know, importantly, I think what it tells women, particularly women who have carried a secret around, as E.G. did for such a long time, that um, we're in a different environment right now. I realize that when women speak up about this, they still get um, a lot of aggravation and maybe not the kind of outcome that E.G. got. But I hope that that will be the outcome, is that more and more women will be less afraid to talk about what happened to them. Mm. Understood. Uh, Jessica, one of the problems in our media or, or discourse is trying to make something about everything. Um, so sometimes we cover an important legal case and people say, well, but will this swing the election? And the answer is, I don't know, and I'm not sure that's the right question. Or if that's the standard, then most everything we do say, write, and think doesn't matter, right? Because who knows what's so pivotal? And I, I thought you spoke to some of this. I want to read briefly a quote, and then you tell us about your reporting and your writing, where you say this trial was also about, quote, the value of a woman, long past middle age, who dared to claim she indeed still had value. Uh, tell us about uh, your piece uh, and what you saw in court. Yeah, you know, sitting in that courtroom, you're surrounded by legal analysts and political reporters, and everyone is watching every little tiny move or motion that Trump makes. And... I just kept thinking, like, what is this actually telling us about the woman who is going to be victorious or who has now been victorious here? You know, she's sitting there two rows in front of this guy. She hasn't been in the same room with him in 30, nearly 30 years. She's sitting upright in her chair. I think one of your contributors, Lisa Rubin, said she looked like the physical embodiment of trauma just in the way she was sitting. She wasn't turning to look at him. And I think it is so rare to see a woman of her age, she is 80 years old, come forward, speak publicly, and do it to a former president. And so in a lot of ways, I just kept noticing these undercurrents of the way that age and ageism and gender were coursing through all of the statements and the entire time in this courtroom. Hmm. Robbie? Well, I mean, I agree. First, I also want to just say thank you for the audacity of E. Jean Carroll, because it really speaks to who she is. I mean, if you even look back, and you talked about this in your piece, um, that who she was as a journalist. I mean, she was among the first women to be on Saturday Night Live and to work for Esquire, which is a very hard place for women to get into in some ways. It still is. Um, but but I agree that, you know, you're sitting there, right? I was I could see Eugene from where I was in the, in the witness stand. And, you know, I know her pretty well, right? Um, she's a very strong person, but you, but you could feel the pain and the agony and um, sort of, but also her will to sit there and talk to him very directly, talk to the jury very directly about what had happened to her and how she felt he should be punished, which I think, you know, um, punitive damages is the biggest part of this whole thing. And it's really big. Yeah, Jessica, Robbie's addressing you in your piece. So go ahead if, if you want to respond. Yeah, no, I mean, one of the things that has irked me since the beginning of this, so I profiled E. Jean with two of my colleagues back in 2019, three days after she came forward with her story. And with Megan Tui and Alexandra Alter, we 
corroborated her claims. And so the two women she had told about them came forward on the record for the first time. And it was fascinating to learn about this incredible career that she had before she was an advice columnist. Now, she was an incredible advice columnist. Robbie certainly knows. She hired her. But she had a 20-year career before that in which she was a gonzo-style journalist that women really did not get credit for doing back then. She wrote a book on Hunter S. Thompson. You know, she profiled all these major people. She was the first female contributing editor at Playboy magazine back when people actually Actually did read Playboy for the article. <laughs> and to see her kind of diminish both in the courtroom, but I think in our coverage of her as a former advice columnist, a former advice columnist, and or that kind of wacky lady that sued Trump has felt really diminishing in a way that I think gets at how ageism in some way has, has played a role in this trial.